Hello and welcome to the webinar of Random Effects Meta-Analysis Methods in Revman as part of a series of online workshops for Cochrane Statistical Editors. To introduce myself, I'm Dr. Areti Angel Veroniki. I am a scientist at the Unity Health Toronto and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and a co-convener of the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group. Before I start, I would like to highlight that this work has been conducted on behalf of the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group, and would like to especially thank my collaborators on this great effort, Joe McKenzie, Dean Langdon, Simon Turner, Mark Simmons, Anna Kaimani, and Kate Wan for their help in producing um, recommendations for the random effects methods to be implemented in Revman, and particularly Joe McKenzie for developing some of the slides in this presentation. The objective of this workshop is to introduce and illustrate the random effects methods that will be implemented in Revman regarding estimation of the heterogeneity variance and its confidence interval, the confidence interval method for the summary effect, and prediction interval method. We will also focus on the impact of applying the new methods on the summary effect of meta-analysis published in the Cochrane Library. So let us start with the random effects model where the observed effects estimate different true effects. So these are represented by dotted vertical lines, which are unobserved. So differences in observed effects are attributed to random error and in true effects is heterogeneity. We assume that the study specific true effects are related and come from the same normal distribution with common mean, the summary treatment effect and variance the uh, tau square, the heterogeneity. Assuming a normal distribution for the outcome in the individual studies, as well as that study effect sizes are independent and the um, effect size variances are known and independent of the, true, um, the study true effect, then the pooled meta-analysis effect is a weighted average of the study effect sizes with weight the inverse of the effect size variance plus the heterogeneity variance. So the summary or, or average effect is of primary interest. Now let us consider the fictional example with 12 studies. Now the choice of the method to estimate the between study variance may give different results on the estimated value, and therefore this may impact on the estimation of the overall of the summary effect size and its uncertainty through the study specific weights calculated under the random effects model. And similarly, the method to estimate uncertainty around the summary effect size may impact its interpretation. Now let's see an illustrative example published in the Cochrane Library by Haddad et al, which was also used as an example in the paper by Thorland et al, published in the Research Synthesis Methods Journal. So this is a meta-analysis comparing cyclosporin with tracrolimus for preventing mortality in liver transplant patients and included 16 studies in total. Under the random effects model, we estimate a number of parameters, including um, a summary effect size along the confidence interval, the between study or heterogeneity variance, and we calculate prediction intervals for the tr true treatment effect in an individual study, and we compute several other statistics such as the I-square. So in this meta-analysis, we perform different methods to estimate heterogeneity and calculate the uncertainty around the summary effect size. And these lead to discrepancies in the results and particularly impact on the width of the confidence interval around the summary effect. This analysis originally found that tracrolimus uh, was superior compared to cyclosporin with no heterogeneity. So the tau score was zero, the I score was zero, and the risk ratio was 0 0.85 with a 95% confidence interval 0 0.73 to uh, 0 0.99. However, changing a random effects method, we can see that a confidence interval um, is spanning from decreasing the risk of mortality by 34% to increasing the risk by 8%. Or that cyclosporine decreases the risk of having an event by um, up to 8%. So this is in this example, um, we have a small positive association of increasing the risk of mortality. But in meta-analysis with fewer studies, which is often the case in Cochrane reviews, changing random effects models may importantly affect the results. 
So the estimation of heterogeneity, standard deviation, using the particular methods produced estimates ranging from 0 to 0 0.28, and this impacts the pooled effect and mainly its precision. It should be considered that estimation of heterogeneity will also impact on the prediction interval calculation. Now, having a closer look at the data, we can see that there is a relatively low proportion of events across studies, and this results in wide confidence intervals, and therefore results in small heterogeneity estimates. However, absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence, and that there is no heterogeneity. Inspecting the forest plot, we can see that there are some discrepancies among the larger studies. So, for example, the studies by Bill Baher et al. and O'Grady et al. seem to be discrepant and similarly with the uh, grade 2003. But also taking a look at the point estimates in the smaller trials, there are several discrepancies as well. So these disagreements should be considered in the model, and certainly we should explore these further. But even in a subgroup analysis, we have to consider that we usually have a small number of studies, and in this case, small number of events as well, and, and small study sizes, which may lead to underestimation of heterogeneity, and the possibility that some heterogeneity exists should not be excluded. Also, using different methods for computing the confidence interval for the summary effect can lead to different results. So it is important to consider that imprecise or biased estimation methods may jeopardize the meta-analysis findings and may lead to inappropriate conclusions. Now, the Dersimonen and Laird is the frequently random effects meta-analysis method used. In particular, the wall type Z-test uh, confidence interval using the Dersimon and Laird for the between study variants are commonly used and are the default options in many meta analysis software and the only random effects method in Revlon. The Dersimon and Laird heterogeneity estimator is a method of moments estimator using the Cochrane Q statistic. And the common wall type CI is based on the normal distribution. However, these methods may be misleading, particularly in small meta analysis, and therefore alternative methods have been suggested which have better performance. We published two papers in the Research Synthesis Methods Journal on behalf of the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group. And based on the literature, um, we include statistical simulations and empirical evaluations of those. Uh, different uh, estimators and different methods that we identified. And we provided recommendations based on these methods and those results um, for methods to be implemented in Revman. The Cochrane Statistical Methods Group followed mainly four steps to formulate recommendations on the random effects methods to be implemented in Revman. First, we used the results from two reviews published in 2016 and 2019, along with one Doro simulation study on the identified heterogeneity methods published in 2017. We also searched the uh, literature to find more recent studies examining the performance of heterogeneity estimators and of the co confidence interval methods for the summary effect size. Then as a second step, we conducted multiple meetings discussing these findings with an aim to select the most appropriate statistical methods for Cochrane reviews. As a third step, we examined the impact of the methods in published Cochrane reviews. And finally, as a fourth step, based on the uh, SMG experience and available evidence, we submitted recommendations and evidence to the Cochrane Scientific Committee. We submitted our recommendations and evidence to the Cochrane Methods Executive for review in January 2022. So recently, these recommendations were accepted and Cochrane are now working towards implementing the new methods. Let's start now with the methods to infer on the between study variants. We conducted a review of the between study variance methods and identified 16 methods to estimate heterogeneity grouped in five broad categories and nine methods to calculate the uncertainty around the between study variance. And these were also grouped in uh, six broad categories. The properties of these methods were evaluated in several simulation and real life data studies comparing at least two methods. 
So the question now is, which is the most appropriate method to use? To select the most appropriate method, we need to assess the properties of the identified methods. First, we need to consider whether an estimator can include the zero value. Um, so the methods can be categorized to positive and non-negative methods. Then ideally, we would like an unbiased estimator or an estimator with a very small negligible bias and a small mean squared error accounting for both bias and variability in tau square. Um, and that's the efficient estimator. For unbiased estimators, where the mean square error is equal to the variance of the tau square, so an estimator has good performance if it's associated with small bias and a small mean square error. Further, we would ideally select an easy to compute estimator. That is, uh, we need to consider the number of complexity of steps to estimate the tau square and whether the method we consider is a direct or an iterative approach. It should be highlighted that REMO, restricted maximum likelihood, and maximum likelihood, and similar, similar iterative methods may not produce a result due to the maximization due to the maximization method used, uh, such as Fisher scoring, and changing maximization method may actually help. Studies have shown that the Dersimone and Laird can underestimate heterogeneity when the number of studies is small and the true heterogeneity variance is large. In these cases, alternative approaches have been suggested. And based on the literature review and more recently published reviews, there are at least 19 methods to estimate heterogeneity. But as you can see, they have different properties and we should be mindful of this. Here we can see whether these estimators are direct, they can include the value of zero, and whether they are simple to compute using closed form formulas. However, we also need to explore how biased and efficient these methods are and under which circumstances. So for example, in the presence of heterogeneity, uh, when a small or large number of studies are included in the meta-analysis and other different cases. In the next few slides, we will discuss the empirical results from four illustrative examples using data from a review um, by Bowden et al, published in 2011. So we um, selected we selected these four meta-analyses to present in our published review as well. And these were sarcoma with 14 trials, assessing whether adjuvant chemotherapy improves survival in patients with localized soft tissue sarcoma. Then we have the meta-analysis with uh, uh, cervix 2 with 18 trials, assessing uh, whether chemoradiotherapy improves survival in women in cervical cancer compared with radiotherapy. Then we have the NSCLC1 with 17 trials, which evaluated the effect of cytotoxic chemotherapy on survival patients with non-small cell, cell lung cancer. And finally, we have the NSCLC4 with 11 trials comparing supportive care plus chemotherapy with standard care alone in patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. The primary outcome in all meta-analysis was overall survival and used the log hazard ratios as an effect size. We selected those um, these meta-analyses on the basis of values of the I-square statistic, measuring the amount of heterogeneity variance as a percentage of the total variation in the treatment effect sizes beyond chance. So the format analysis represent very low heterogeneity, um, that's sarcoma with an I-square, 0%, Low heterogeneity, that's cervix 2 with an I square 18%. Moderate heterogeneity with an I square 45%, and high heterogeneity with an I square 75%. We combined the aggregated data in a random effects model using the different estimation methods for the heterogeneity variance. In this table, you can see the estimated results for heterogeneity across the four examples. In green, I have highlighted the lowest estimated heterogeneity value, and in red, the highest estimated heterogeneity value. 
So as you can see, the estimated heterogeneity value can considerably vary among the methods. To infer on which is the best estimator for the heterogeneity variance, we have summarized the results on published statistical simulation studies. Overall, simulations suggest that Paul and Mandel and restricted maximum likelihood estimators are better alternatives to estimate the between study variance than the Gersimonen and Laird, and mainly based on assessing bias and mean square error in, in these uh, methods. Before we make any inference on the choice of other estimation alternatives, we need to understand which are the main factors that may affect the between study variance estimation. So these include, according to the public studies, number and size of studies, magnitude of heterogeneity, distribution of true treatment effects, type of data, effect measure, frequency of events, and how well study-specific weights, uh, variances, effect sizes are estimated. And these are often assumed to be known, the variance of the effect sizes. An empirical study using around 60,000 Cochrane meta-analyses has shown that heterogeneity fails to be detected and is generally higher than what is assumed. So we need alternative methods to estimate heterogeneity. The majority of pairwise meta-analyses include fewer than 10 studies and even fewer than five, and than five studies and a small between study variance. The Gersimonen and Laird is the most popular estimator and the default option in most meta-analytical software. But lately, we've seen that this has started changing. So the DL is a method of moments estimator and can be derived by equating the expected value of the Cochrane Q statistic to its observed value. It uses the fixed effect weights and is unbiased before truncation to zero and under the assumptions of the random effects model. However, the truncation to zero may lead to biased results. Simulations suggest that the Dersimonen and Laird underestimates heterogeneity, the tau square, particularly when heterogeneity is large and studies are small in number. Overall, it has unsuitable statistical properties in certain cases, such as the few, when we have few studies, when we have small studies, when we have rare events, moderate to high heterogeneity, um, and therefore the, uh, the unsuitable statistical properties might be the inflated type one error rate, confidence intervals that are too narrow, and so on. So in particular, the restricted maximum likelihood and Paul and Mandel are the two most viable alternative methods for estimating heterogeneity. And they yield better estimates than the Dersimone and Laird and have been recommended by the authors of numerous simulation studies. Paul and Mandel propose to profile the generalized Q statistic with random effects weights until it equals its expected value. Its assessment through simulation studies has shown that PM reduces bias compared to the Dersimone and Laird as heterogeneity increases for both continuous and dichotomous data. But the PM method may overestimate heterogeneity when the true heterogeneity is small and there are few studies. And it may also underestimate heterogeneity for rare events. It can also increase bias when study sizes differ importantly in a meta-analysis. And this is due to the random effects study weights that are not adequately reflecting these size differences in the presence of heterogeneity. The REMO estimate is produced by setting the derivative of the restricted log likelihood function equal to zero and solving the resulting equation for tau square. Simulation studies showed that REMU is less negatively biased than DL and is recommended for continuous data, but has greater mean square error. Overall, the method has been shown to yield better estimates than DL in meta-analysis with characteristics similar to those found in Cochrane reviews. But a limitation of REMU is that it is an iterative method, requires actually numerical maximization, and um, such algorithms fail to converge in a small number of cases. In total, all methods decrease bias as the number of studies increases. However, when there are few studies available, especially when there are small 
with rare events, it is rarely appropriate to rely on only one heterogeneity variance method. So there is no uniformly best approach for all the analytical scenarios. And this is something that we need to remember. Now, in this table, we summarize the properties of the three estimators, DL, REML, and PM. Based on the findings of simulation studies, the size of the summary effect has little bearing on the properties of these methods. And we did not consider this in forming our recommendations. Similarly, our recommendations were not based on the perceived level of heterogeneity, since this can actually be estimated in practice. We never know the true heterogeneity. And in total, we concluded that there is currently no clear grounds to prefer the PM method over the REML method. So we did not recommend um, that PM be implemented in Revman at present. And mainly that's to avoid confusion that might arise from providing multiple heterogeneity variance estimators. Now, in order to estimate between study variants, apart from the point estimate of the between study variants, we can also calculate the uncertainty around the between study variants. The desirable properties of the interval calculation include accuracy, that is high coverage probability, and precision of the confidence interval. Methods that provide now narrower confidence intervals while retaining the correct coverage probability are preferable, and that's because they increase precision and therefore they are more informative. It is possible to calculate a confidence interval for the estimate of heterogeneity variance, but this is not frequently used in systematic reviews. There are at least nine confidence interval methods categorized in six broader categories, as you can see here. And most comparative studies compare the different methods according to coverage and only a few according to their precision. So we need more evidence actually. Different methods may suggest different results. And here you can see the results of different CI methods for calculating the uncertainty for the between study variance using the four examples that we discussed in the previous slides. You may um, also notice that most of the CI methods differ in the width, and some of them may not even overlap. Another important consideration is whether the heterogeneity estimator used can be combined with any of these confidence intervals. In this table, you can see the multiple approaches to estimate the uncertainty around the between study variance and estimators for the between study variance that are likely to be considered appropriate in practice. With TIC, as you can see, we present the methods that are based on the same statistical principle and can be naturally paired. With TIC in a parenthesis, we represent those that could in principle be paired but not naturally, and with dot line, those that are unlikely to be considered compatible. Therefore, as you can see, not all of the confidence intervals are appropriate for all the heterogeneity estimators, and we suggest using only methods based on the same statistical principle that can be naturally paired to avoid confidence intervals not containing the estimate of heterogeneity. Now, accounting for the fact that heterogeneity estimation method and CI method should be based on the same statistical principle, and that, uh, that can be naturally paired, we considered that a confidence interval for both DL and REML estimators can be calculated using the generalized Q-statistic method. Based on the scenarios and results presented in published studies, the method provides narrow confidence intervals and good coverage. An alternative method for use uh, with the restricted maximum likelihood is the profile likelihood CI, but it is not exact by construction and relies on the asymptotic behavior of the likelihood ratio statistic, which means that they can be inaccurate in meta-analysis with Q studies. And that's often the case in Cochrane reviews. So for this reason, we recommend the generalized Q statistic method for calculating the CI for the REM estimate of heterogeneity. And that's what we um, actually have suggested um, to be implemented in Redman. So in the question whether we should consider additional options in Redman, the answer is definitely yes. Overall, the Cochrane Statistical Methods Group 
recommends the following. The restricted maximum likelihood method to estimate heterogeneity, and this method has been shown to outperform other estimators for this parameter in meta-analytical scenarios commonly seen in Cochrane views. And we recommend that REML be offered as the default option for new and updated reviews. Now, in cases where REML cannot provide a unique estimate for heterogeneity variance, when a scoring algorithm such as the Fisher scoring or, or the newton raphson method cannot solve the maximum likelihood equations numerically, we can use the, D, the DL method. And uh, that's because DL actually is a closed form, non-iterative method. And we also suggest methods to uh, calculate confidence intervals for the heterogeneity variance. And the choice of confidence interval method is linked to the method used to calculate the heterogeneity variance. And therefore, we recommend the CI is calculated using the generalized Q statistic method. Now, at the second part of this workshop, we'll discuss about inference on the summary effect size. Using one of the previous illustration examples, the NSCLC4, um, with high heterogeneity according to I square, we can see that when applying different methods to estimate a confidence interval for the summary effect size, the widths of the different CIs can vary. We observe these differences even if there is a good amount of studies in this example, that is 11 studies, which is mostly not the case in Cochrane reviews. The 95% CIs may span from considerably reducing the risk of mortality up to a trivial risk decrease, or even up to increasing the risk of mortality by 6%. So the question now is, which is the most appropriate method to use? We conducted the literature search and identified 15 methods to compute SCI for the overall effect size that can be grouped in seven broad categories. So these methods have been evaluated in 30 simulation and 32 real life data studies. The identified studies acknowledge that the wall type method with the normal distribution is the most popular. Using the same four illustrative examples that we discussed in the previous slides, we compared the different CI methods. Overall, and across all meta-analysis, all methods give similar results and with small changes in the precision of the interval. And here I highlight in green the narrowest confidence intervals and in red the widest confidence intervals in each case. So we can see that the wall type method with a normal distribution in blue lies among the narrowest CIs, whereas the Bayesian credible intervals in black among the largest intervals. Also, the modified hartang napf sitting jongman has the largest width for low and very low I-square values, whereas, the substantial, whereas for substantial I-square, the um, hartang napf sitting jongman method has the widest confidence interval. Now, as a reminder, to select among the different methods, we need a CI with high coverage probability for overall mean effects close to the nominal level which actually considers the number of times that the true mean effect is included into the calculated CI. And we also need a method with narrow CIs for the summary effect. Simulation study findings suggest that the wall type method with the Z-test with the normal distribution um, is already which is already implemented in Revman has considerably low coverage unless the size and number of studies are large and heterogeneity is low. So the wall type method performs well when a large number of studies is included in the meta-analysis and also depends on the heterogeneity magnitude. Its coverage can be low as 65% when high heterogeneity, um, when, when we have high heterogeneity and uh, only two or three studies available. Hartan and Knapp and Sedig and Jonkman independently proposed a modified method which involves a small sample adjustment and uses uh, the T distribution in the calculation of the confidence interval. Now, in contrast to the wall type, the hartang napf sidig jockman method provides wider confidence intervals compared to the wall type method, is not influenced by the magnitude of heterogeneity 
or the heterogen the estimator of heterogeneity and is insensitive to the number of included studies. Simulations have shown that it performs well for both continuous and dichotomous data in most random effects meta-analysis, meta-analytic scenarios. But it can be suboptimal to the whole type method for rare events and in the absence of heterogeneity. However, the hartung knapp sending jokman method can result in confidence intervals that are smaller in width than the whole type CI. Attention is also needed when three or fewer studies are available and in the absence of heterogeneity, as it has coverage less than the nominal level and the CI may be narrower than the corresponding wall type CI. And that's because with zero heterogeneity, the variance of the estimated summary effect can be the VAR actually here, can be inaccurately small. And so then is sigma square. Since also the quantity Q that is included in the sigma square um, becomes lower than the unity, the, nu the number one actually in this case. And therefore the hartung napsid jokman confidence interval becomes too narrow. Now, a number of ad hoc adjustments have been proposed to deal with this. And while these adjustments ensure that the hartung knapp sitting jokman CI will never be smaller than the world type CI, they can result in over-conservative results. For example, in such cases, the modified hartung knapp sitting jokman method has been suggested using the maximum between Q and 1 um, in the calculation of the variance of the summary effect, the sigma, the sigma square, or it has been suggested to use a hybrid approach between wall type and hartung knapp sitting jokman approaches for um, heterogeneity above zero to um, ensure more conservative results. But it is important to note that the modified hartung knapp sitting jokman method can be over conservative. So at this point, selection between the methods as a matter of power versus type one error or versus coverage. Now, in this table, we summarize the properties of the wall type Z test method, the hartung knapp sitting jokman and the modified hartung knapp sitting jokman methods. Um, and we summarize those uh, properties per number of studies and presence of heterogeneity. As you can see, none of the methods had an optimal coverage across all settings. The hartung knapp sitting jokman and its modification do not depend on the heterogeneity magnitude when heterogeneity is above zero. Um, the heterogeneity estimator that we used or the outcome type that we used. So we, we did not consider this in the table. Overall, studies suggest that the hartung knapp sitting jokman method has one of the best performance profiles. But caution is there when heterogeneity is zero. So it should be noted that despite simulation studies assessed coverage as the key property of the confidence intervals, we also need to explore the width of the CI in different settings. So the question that arises now is whether we should consider any additional methods to calculate the uncertainty in the summary effect in Revman. Our recommendations take all the previously mentioned issues into account. So based on the findings of the simulation studies, we recommend implementation of the following. The hartung knapp sitting jokman method when the number of studies in the meta-analysis is greater than two and the estimated heterogeneity variance is estimated to be greater than zero. But the wall type method when the number of studies in the meta-analysis is above two and in the absence of heterogeneity, which is actually estimated to be zero. And in the case of the number of studies in the meta-analysis being two, um, we suggest both hartung knapp sitting jongman and wall type methods to be used. When presenting now both hartung knapp sitting jongman and wall type CIs in the case of two studies, and we see that there is a disagreement between the two methods that should tell us that results are inconclusive and more evidence is needed before a conclusion can be reached. Another important aim in decision making is the prediction of the true effect size in an individual future study and in an individual setting. Although prediction intervals provide additional information to the confidence intervals and provide useful information, they have not often been used in practice. Under the random effects model, we are able to account for low to, to moderate heterogeneity and we estimate a mean effect. 
As discussed, the summary effect size is only an estimate and it is associated with a magnitude of uncertainty that can be presented by the confidence interval. The confidence interval tells us that in the population of studies, using the studies including the meta-analysis, the actual summary effect probably falls somewhere in the range from the lower interval point up to the higher interval point presented. So the confidence interval is a measure of precision and not a measure of dispersion. It tells us how accurately we are able to estimate the summary effect, but it does not tell us anything about how the actual effect size varies among studies. To predict what the distribution effects looks like, if we look at the entire population, we will need a prediction interval. The prediction interval gives us the interval within which we expect the effect of future studies to lie. So the effect size in any given study may fall between the low and upper point of the prediction interval. To calculate the prediction interval, we need the summary effect under the random effects model, its variance, the heterogeneity estimate, and the number of studies. So several ways have been suggested to present a prediction interval in the forest plot, as you can see at the bottom of this forest plot, but it certainly should not be confused with the confidence interval interpretation. Importantly, we should consider that prediction intervals are based on the assumption that the study effects are normally distributed. Using again one of the previous illustration examples, the NSCLC4 with high heterogeneity according to I square, I present the relevant for a spot showing the observed outcomes of 11 studies and the estimate based on the random effects model, which is a hazard ratio of 0 0.76. The observed study specific hazard ratios range uh, from 0 0.20 to 1.45, with the majority of estimates, uh, actually 8 of 11, which is around 75%, being below the line of no effect. So the question is, does the treatment reduce the risk of having an event? The estimated average hazard ratio based on the random effects model was 0 0.76. And that suggests that on average, the treatment reduces the risk by 24%. The confidence interval for the hazard ratio is 0 0.58 to 1, and that tells us that the mean effect size in the population of studies could fall anywhere within this range. So this range includes the effect size of 1, and that tells us that the true effect may also be 1. This is, this is supported by the Z value and the corresponding P value. The Z value is minus 1.95 and the P value is equal to 0 0.051. So we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the treatment has no impact on the, on the outcome. But does the effect size vary across studies? According to the Q test, the uh, true uh, the true outcomes appear to be heterogeneous. So we have a very small p value, a tau, a tau square equal to zero point forty, and an i square uh, equal to seventy eight percent. Now, considering the log scale of the hazard ratio, so we have an average estimate equal to minus zero point twenty seven and a confidence interval ranging from zero, minus 0 0.55 to zero. And we note that the random effects are normally distributed around the mean minus 0 0.27 with variance the squared 0 0.14. A 95% prediction interval for the true outcome is given by minus 1.10 to 0 0.56 on the log scale or 0 0.33 to 1.75 on the original scale. So we would expect that in the 95% of all the studies, the true effect size will fall in this range. And therefore, although the average outcome is estimated to be below the line of no effect, below one, in some studies, the true outcome may in fact be greater than one. And given this range of effects, as a next step, you might want to explore why the treatment effect is more effective in some populations than others. So we might want to perform a subgroup analysis 
or the regression and even further exploration. So overall, the confidence interval tells us that the true summary log hazard ratio probably falls in the range of minus 0 0.55 to 0. And the prediction interval tells us that the true log hazard ratio for any single study will probably fall in the range of minus 1.10 to 0 0.56. Several methods have been suggested to calculate a prediction interval for the treatment effect in a new study, and the most commonly encountered are the ones using a normal distribution and t distribution. A comparison of a standard confidence interval, which does not capture heterogeneity, um, and a prediction interval, which capture, captures heterogeneity, may also provide an approach for assessing the importance of any observed heterogeneity. In the absence of heterogeneity, confidence intervals and prediction intervals should be identical. To ensure this, we recommend that when using the hartang naps and Jongma method for the confidence interval, the prediction interval is calculated using a t-distribution with k-1 degrees of freedom rather than the commonly used k-2 degrees of freedom with k, number, with k the number of studies. Um, similarly, we recommend that a standard normal distribution is used to compute a prediction interval when the wall type method is used for the confidence interval. And, the, and that's also the approach taken in other meta-analytical software, such as the metaphor package in R. It should be considered that all suggested approaches, the normal distribution, the t-distribution with k-1 or k-2 degrees of freedom are only approximations and all make the strong assumption that the study-specific effects are normally distributed. Overall, we recommend the calculation of prediction intervals when the number of studies in the meta-analysis is greater than two in order to allow for a better estimation for heterogeneity. Prediction intervals are particularly helpful when substantial heterogeneity exists, where the combination of individual studies into meta-analysis would not be advisable, actually. An empirical study showed that more than 70% of statistical significant Cochrane meta-analysis with tau square positive may have a null or even in the opposite direction effect size in a new study. However, simulations suggest that prediction intervals perform well for large heterogeneity and similar study sizes. On the contrary, for small heterogeneity and different study sizes, their coverage can be as low as 78%. Despite there are some concerns regarding coverage probability of prediction intervals and their dependence on the heterogeneity estimator, the Cochrane Handbook encourages their use um, when the number of studies is actually more than 10 and in the absence of panel plot asymmetry. Overall, we recommend that methods to calculate prediction intervals should be implemented in Revman. We recommend that the t-distribution prediction interval is used when the modified hartang napsidik jongman confidence interval is selected and the normal distribution prediction interval when we use actually the wall type normal distribution uh, confidence interval. To demonstrate the impact of applying the different random effects methods on Cochrane meta-analysis, we reanalyzed approximately 3,000 meta-analysis from the Cochrane library, and those included approximately 1,000 continuous uh, and approximately uh, 1,500 or more dichotomous outcomes. We included reviews with both binary and continuous outcomes published up to February 11th, 2021, and using a random effects model in analysis with more than two studies. So this plot here presents the weights of the confidence intervals of the summary effect as compared between the methods. For each meta-analysis, a ratio of the CI weights from the two random effect methods um, was calculated, and then this was scaled so that the confidence interval for the reference method um, ranges from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, and that's indicated by the yellow shaded area here. Its vertical line now is in the plot represents the comparison in uh, the confidence intervals for one single meta-analysis. Vertical lines 
polling entirely within the yellow shaded area indicated indicate the CI is smaller than that of the reference method. And vertical lines extending beyond the shaded area indicate the confidence intervals are larger than the reference method. Now let's compare uh, restricted maximum likelihood with the Dersimon and Laird using the wall type confidence interval. That's actually the standard method implemented in Redman. So what is evident is that there is not a major difference between the methods. And only for a small fraction of meta-analysis, the confidence interval will be wider when we use actually the restricted maximum likelihood. But implementing the recommended CI method affected the CI width of a large percentage of meta-analysis. Specifically, the, the majority of meta-analysis with Remel heterogeneity estimator and uh, the hard and napsiding Jongman or wall type CIs, depending on the estimate of heterogeneity, um, had wider confidence intervals as compared to the current default method in Revman, the DL plus the wall type CI. So the major driver of wider confidence intervals comes from the use of the hard and upset in Jongman method. And for the majority of meta-analysis, the CIs were larger when we used the recommended CI method. And that's important as it may impact the certainty of evidence assessments of some meta-analysis through changes to the assessment of imprecision. Now, in this graph or matrix, we can say um, the p-values of the summary effect estimates are compared between the methods by categorizing the p-values based on the commonly used level of, statist of statistical significance, the 5%. The upper diagonal plots actually use uh, also the one and the 10% cut of values. Um, but for its pairwise comparison, the percentage of meta-analysis with agreement on the statistical significance was calculated here. So we can see that um, concordant results are shown in blue, whereas discordant results are shown as either white, orange, red, or purple. The color bands surrounding the left and the right and the top and the bottom side of its plot within the graphs indicate the two methods being compared. Changing heterogeneity estimator from DL to Remel only affected the statistical significance of a very small percentage of meta-analysis on the library. So you can see that here. So implementing the recommended CI method affected the statistical significance of 13% of meta-analysis at the significance level of actually of the 5% that we are discussing. And specifically, the 13% of the meta-analysis that were statistically significant at the 5% level using the current default method in Revman, the DL and the wall type method, became non-significant when we used the recommended method, the REM and the hard and up or wall type CI. So it's time for change. Overall, we recommend the use of a restricted maximum likelihood heterogeneity estimator in new and updated reviews, since it has been shown to yield marginally better estimates than DL in meta-analysis with characteristics similar to those in Cochrane reviews. Also, um, we recommend to calculate CIs for tau using the generalized Q-statistic method and for at least three studies in the meta-analysis to use the hart and napsiding jonkman method when heterogeneity is above zero and for zero heterogeneity, the wall type method. Um, whereas in the case of two studies, we recommend both to use both methods. And we suggested implementation of prediction intervals using the standard normal distribution when the wall type method is used and the T distribution when the hard and up sitting Jonkman is used. The Cochrane methods executive, um, the core Cochrane staff and the editor in chief have reviewed our recommendations for random effects methods to be implemented in Revman and they have endorsed the use of Remel heterogeneity estimator in new and updated reviews. Um, the choice of wall type and hard and up sitting Jongman based on the number of studies and presence or absence of heterogeneity of the actually the estimated heterogeneity. 
the calculation of CIs for tau using the generalized Q statistic method to have this as the default option and the implementation of prediction intervals as optional. Now, in conclusion, the Dersimonian and Laird random effects method can be misleading, particularly in small meta-analysis. Alternative methods exist with better performance than the commonly used DL. Our systematic review of the available evidence on these methods led to recommending new methods for Cochrane abuse and Revman. And it should be considered that implementation of these methods may impact on the precision and, inter and interpretation of results. So I will stop here. Thank you so much for listening to this webinar. I would like to remind you that there will be a live virtual workshop for this session, including discussion, questions, and answers. Thank you so much.